Good afternoon, and welcome to HealthSystemCIO.com's All-Star Panel, Clearing Up the Cloud, a webinar tweet chat combo from HealthSystemCIO.com, sponsored by ClearData. Just some housekeeping before we get started. I'm the moderator. My name is Anthony Guerra, and I'm the editor-in-chief of HealthSystemCIO.com. We are having a simultaneous tweet chat hosted by our managing editor and director of social media, Kate Gamble. You can participate in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat. Or if you want to just view the stream uh, of the tweet chat, you can do that in the media viewer panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. Other WebEx panels that will come into play today are your polling panel. We're going to do a few live polls. And uh, your Q&A panel. You could submit a question at any time through the Q&A panel in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and keep the default set to all panelists. We will take those questions later in the program, but send them in as they occur to you. And you can see the URL for the deck on your screen. You can download that at any time, and it also will be sent out in the chat box. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go about 40 minutes with our main panel discussion, featuring David Chow, Chief Information and Digital Officer with Children's Mercy Hospital, Art Reem, Director of Applications and Chief Information Security Officer with the Cambridge Health Alliance. Debbie Gash, VP and CIO at St. Luke's Health System, and Scott White, SVP of Growth and Innovation with Clear Data. So without further delay, we are going to jump right into our panel discussion. Um, and let's start with an overview of your organizations. David, a little bit about Children's Mercy Hospital. Thanks, Anthony. Um, hello, everyone. Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City is a standalone pediatric hospital. Um, we have two main hospitals with about 40 plus clinics throughout the Kansas City, Missouri, um, and Kansas region. I would say uh, we are growing, and we are one of the very few standalone pediatric hospitals in the U.S. at this junction. So we work hard to try to provide the best care uh, for the community. Um, I would say one thing that we'd like to brag about is we're, we've been successful in, in getting the magnet recognition a few years in a row. So we want to pace through that again next year. Um, it's a great place to be. I've been here for almost six months now as we speak. Very good. David, if you could just try and speak a little louder, I would appreciate it. I think that would help if you could do that. Uh, very good. Um, Debbie, a little bit about St. Luke's. Uh, St. Luke's Health System, uh, we have 10 hospitals. Uh, we employ about 550 providers in our community and have, um, I guess, uh, over 100 ambulatory locations at this point in time. Uh, we also have a home care and hospice organization. Uh, three of our hospitals are critical access facilities located in uh, rural Missouri and Kansas and uh, a growing organization too, also uh, as with Children's Mercy located in the Kansas City market. And uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, presenting to this group. Wonderful, thank you, Debbie. Uh, Scott, a little bit about Clear Data. Sure, thank you. So Clear Data is a cloud service provider. We provide a secure cloud platform exclusively for healthcare, and we're passionate about you know, trying to improve healthcare and make it healthier. We have uh, over 200 customers, including hospitals and physician groups, payers, pharma, life sciences, medical device companies, and then the whole um, suite of solution providers like EMR and analytics companies that serve um, healthcare. So we design, we build, and we manage cloud environments with, uh, that are high trust certified and that include a, a real comprehensive business associate agreement. Very good. All right. Well, just uh, so our audience knows, Art has logged on and he's working on calling in. So we will bring him into the discussion as soon as he is able to connect with us. Um, Debbie, let's start with you on this question. Uh, if you would talk about your journey to the cloud, what applications have you put in the cloud? What went well and what didn't? Um, just an overview of your experiences and lessons learned. 
Well, I think over the last five years, I've seen an increase in the number of cloud solutions that are offered in the healthcare space. And historically, they've been, you know, pretty much, um, you know, simple kind of add-on capabilities that specific departments wanted to use. They really weren't um, focused on core uh, functions that the health system provided. Um, we had an increasing demand in our organization to be able to support telecommuting and uh, being able to make it possible for our physicians and our employees to be able to operate and function within our IT systems wherever they were. So we developed our private cloud environment to make that remote access more feasible for our organization. And then of recent, we've seen more and more of our core applications being offered through cloud services. Um, we see this with physician practices um, adopting EMRs that are in the cloud. Um, the health system had really been averse to, you know, allowing a vendor to host a key system that might be core to our business. Uh, but recently we've made that leap and uh, one of the systems that we've just recently moved to the cloud is our ERP technology. So um, we're on a path to adopt a cloud-based ERP solution and have actually went live at the beginning of this month with General Financials and have plans to push, uh, uh, move forward with the, deploying the human capital management functions of that ERP and then eventually the materials or the supply chain functions. Um, we're also seeing a number of analytic solutions being offered in the cloud and uh, look as that an opportunity for us to adopt and advance our analytics strategy by leveraging cloud solutions. So we're also pursuing those opportunities as well in our organization. Very good. All right. Art has joined us. So, Art, could you, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for joining. And could you tell us a little overview on Cambridge Health Alliance? And then if you want to address the question about your journey to the cloud and, and some experiences and lessons learned. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, my apologies for being a, a little late here. Um, Cambridge Health Alliance is a three hospital system which resides in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Everett, Massachusetts is another critical care hospital in Somerville, Mass. We have 15 primary care clinics, a significant behavioral health uh, operation. Uh, we're a teaching hospital for Tufts, Harvard uh, University. We are a safety net hospital for the state of Massachusetts. So in other words, we handle the, handle the underserved population. Um, we are clinics. And um, our hospitals are him stage six with ambulatory looking for a stage seven currently. Um, so that's kind of an overview of Cambridge Health Alliance uh, as a whole. Journey to the cloud, funny. An apropos uh, session. Next week we are migrating the entire hospital um, off of Microsoft Office products and up to Google Apps for work. Um, so we are moving everything for the organization up there. Um, we currently do a lot of cloud-based solutions for our credentialing, for our secured shared files that we pass back and forth to our insurance agencies. Um, we're doing a lot of applications for the pharmacy and the regulatory uh, operations, which are now being cloud-based, based on regulatory uh, initiatives in the state of Massachusetts. So. We've got some some of those rolling right now. So the, the bigger one taking most of our attention is um, obviously the Google at work. Very good. Okay, uh, David, your journey to the cloud. Uh, you wrote an article for us recently that really got the ball rolling on this whole event. Uh, once I read it, I said, wow, there's a great topic. So uh, talk about your journey to the cloud. So one of my goals is to really get out of the data center business. 
and try to utilize public clouds as much as I can. Obviously, it's not going to happen overnight, so there will be a transition to have a hybrid model, and most likely everyone will have some sort of hybrid model. But one of my, I really want to get out of data center business. I just do not want to have any footprint, if possible, or minimal footprint, I would say, in the data center with our key core application. So um, we have our ERP that's hosted in Amazon as we speak. That's in the public cloud. We're transitioning some of the other major applications to see whether we could fit them into the Azure platform. We have a homegrown cardiovascular app, sort of a cardiovascular EMR that's built entirely on the Microsoft stack. So off the Azure platform, utilizing the Microsoft tablets. So um, we're slowly transitioning to that stage. For us, it may be a little bit easier than some of the other organizations because I've inherited a lot of legacy infrastructure. So I am at a, a decision point where I do have to figure out what is the next step for my infrastructure, whether it is offloaded to a cloud provider or try to build the same infrastructure in-house. Uh, I, I think for me, it would, the goal is to really remove that footprint just from a security aspect, from a performance aspect, and being able to scale quickly. Um, I, I, I can't do that as fast um, if I'm trying to build a data center or trying to build that infrastructure. Therefore, really trying to utilize the technology that we're seeing out there from all the various cloud providers. One of the biggest challenges that we I have um, witnessed is a lot of the healthcare applications are not cloud ready. So that's, that's going to be a big hurdle if some of the applications are not going to function well in the public cloud arena. Obviously, you could build the private cloud in-house, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to utilize the public cloud as much as possible. So uh, we'll see how that journey folds, and I'll, che I'll check back with you, Anthony, in about two years. You can ask me the same question as <laughs> my journey towards the cloud. But uh, as of right now, the, the strategy is really to get, get out of the data center business and utilize as much of the public cloud infrastructure as much as I can. And David, just a quick follow-up. It sounds like there is absolutely no hesitation about the general strategy. You're 100% you're sure um, of which way you want to go. Yes, first of all, um, that's where I want to go. You, you will encounter lots of resistance from your technology teams who are not used to that concept of cloud first. Um, because most of them have grown up managing infrastructure, and they may not have, you know, as as the as the role of the CIO changes, as the role of even the IT department changes to where we're here to provide more business value than managing infrastructure. It's a, it's a new concept for a lot of folks, so there's a lot of education that needs to go in, uh, especially when I talk to my engineers who are somewhat resistant when they hear about a cloud first strategy. The first the first instinct is what happens to my job. Mm -hmm. All the, right. the, the education that needs to happen is your job is going to shift to provide business value versus managing infrastructure. If it takes you three to six months to spin up infrastructure, whether that, and most of the time it may because it includes procurement, it includes contracting, right sizing, creating environments and tests and production. I mean, all that time could be used towards helping the business with other business problems versus managing infrastructure. So trying to shift that mentally is, is the first hurdle that most uh, executives would have to try to smooth out before having that cloud-first uh, strategy. So that's, that's something I work on constantly, and I have discussions with my team constantly as far as where the value is versus managing traditional infrastructure like what they have been accustomed to in the last 10 to 15 years. Debbie, uh, did you do you see the same uh, thing? Do you see a um, a cultural issue with moving to the cloud? And it was because some folks are fearing, well, this is kind of what I used to do, and if someone else is going to do it, then that means I won't have a job. Well, I think the staff do have some apprehension about what it means for them in their job. Um, but we've really focused within the IT organization to really um, redefine their roles and responsibilities uh, and 
uh, have really been shifting towards that kind of bimodal operation where, you know, you have a team that's kind of focused on running the business and keeping the lights on, and then you've got a team that's really trying to drive innovation and derive value from the investments and really focusing their time as much as we can on the innovation and growing the business, which is quite frankly what they're more interested in doing. Um, so I, I think they've been viewing it as a positive move to take some of those more uh, mundane types of tasks and shifting that responsibility to other resources or organizations. So I haven't really seen the uh, pushback coming from the IT staff. I think the organization has kind of questioned, is this the right thing for us to do, um, particularly in, you know, light of all of the cybersecurity incidents that are occurring in the market today. So it's the questions about, is it secure that I get relative to approaching a cloud-based solution? And Art, uh, would you say that there's a counter to that and that um, this can be secure, if not far more secure, because uh, sort of this is what these people do for a living, the people that you're offloading the applications to? Yeah, I mean, I have to, um, I have to comment on uh, David's comment as well. Um, from, sure. Uh, the overhead from a data center perspective, we went from, you know, a lot of boxes sitting in shelves and on racks to, you know, a, like you said, a reduced footprint to almost 100% virtualization. So that ultimately gives my data center and my operations high availability because if I lose something, it swaps over, you know, almost seamlessly. But then we move to the cloud and the security in the cloud. Um, that is what their job is. That is what they do for a living uh, from retail all the way down to healthcare. And the other thing of it is, is, you know, if you've had any experience in it, um, particularly, you know, my experience with Google at this point in time, is they offer a core set of applications. How you configure them to remain secure is ultimately up to you. They present them secure. They give you the settings, and when you deviate from that, it's up to you to understand the risk and take the risk if you decide to do that. But for the large part, you are secure until you start manipulating it. Most of mm -hmm. these companies will give you an actual audit time. They will they will come in and do an audit and say, these are your gaps, these are this. Um, so when you really think about this, you get them secure, you can unsecure them, so it's ultimately your responsibility and understanding of your infrastructure in order to do that. Moving to the cloud, moving to virtualization, like David said, this goes and frees up your infrastructure team. They have the time to think about these things. They're not building hardware all the time. They understand the technology, and I think, you know, that's, that's an important part to understand. Very good. Scott, I would like to ask you, um, obviously, a different perspective on the vendor side. You're dealing with multiple organizations. Uh, some are making inquiries to you, some you're just going out and speaking with, trying to understand what their pain points are and if your solution is a good fit for what they're going through. So typically, what are the issues that uh, people are presenting to you? What are the problems they're trying to solve? And what is uh, what is the cloud a good solution to? What kind of problems? Right. So thank you. You know, it, it's interesting. When I speak with prospects and customers, healthcare executives across the country, um, representing Clear Data, a cloud service provider, it's it's very similar to my experience, my personal experience as a CIO and a VP of a 40 hospital system, and and you've heard some of the things from you know David and Art and Debbie, and that is there's this need for agility and innovation, and then there's also this need for security, um, a huge. Uh, pressures on healthcare as we move to value-based care and uh, challenges with re reimbursement and, and new innovative ways of, of engaging patients and engaging providers. It's a, it's a really, it's an exciting time in healthcare, but it's a very difficult time. And so we're pushed to, to move more quickly. Um, but we also have these huge security exposures. So we have this, these two um, tensions that as we as IT executives speak with 
uh, clinicians, chief medical officers, physicians, and other you know, clinical leaders, and then uh, presidents of, of uh, you know, hospitals or, or uh, business service lines and things like that. They're, they're demanding that we move quickly, but that we stay, stay secure. So I'm hearing those um, pressures, and I think the cloud uh, you know, correctly designed and implemented and operated absolutely meets the, that need for agility. It's the cloud was created and designed to do that, and the public clouds in particular have uh, huge innovation in terms of services that allow um, uh, you to think of the cloud more as software as opposed to hardware, and software is very malleable and you can move it quickly. Uh, at the same time, they are highly secure, or just, uh, I think as Art mentioned, they, they can be made secure and, be made, and, and can be kept secure. So I think cloud is a, is a great position. So specific workloads, a lot of times they're, they're net new workloads, things like um, analytics or consumer patient portals, or there may be uh, joint venture kind of collaboration environments where somebody doesn't want to send their data to the competitor hospital across the street, or they don't want to send their data to the payer, but they don't mind putting it in sort of a Switzerland space that's neutral. And that allows people who are sometimes, you know, business partners and sometimes competitors to partner effectively, you know, to improve patient care in a community. So that's another area. Um, and then for legacy applications, you know, I, I do see office automation, things like Office 365 or Google or things like that that are a little easier because it's more than just infrastructure, the, the cloud is providing a platform. There's, it's a suite of solutions. And typically, at least by policy, those, um, they don't, you shouldn't have public uh, PHI on, on those environments. So oftentimes that's an easier first step for organizations. Other first steps that we see for legacy applications, um, you know, instead of forklifting a, a, an EMR over, um, sometimes uh, organizations will start with backup or disaster recovery, things like that, that help them take advantage of the cloud, but are less disruptive to the, um, you know, the immediate operations of the organization. Very good. Debbie, let me uh, ask you to comment on um, Art's comment about you can, you can get it uh, secure and then screw it up, so, so to speak, um, you know, through your customization. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> when, when you're looking at, um, you know, some of the collaboration tools, I call them collaboration tools, so like the Microsoft, the Google, type of products, sure, you can you can make configuration changes. Even with, um, you know, we are, we're just getting ready to implement our ERP system or to have just gone live. I mean, there were configuration options relative to the security settings that you can elect to uh, change if you want to. Um, the vendors advise you what to do, and people have to evaluate, um, you know, kind of the the limitations in access that it might present. Um, so I do agree with that. You you can make it less secure or more secure depending on what you are really trying to accomplish. Um, so there's lots of tools that you can layer on as, uh, you know, access uh, security options. Um, you know, I look at, you know, email and, do you allow active sync on your smartphone to your email system? And, you know, St. Luke's took the position, no, we don't allow active sync. We leverage a product called Good that kind of containerizes the email and makes it available. Um, so there are lots of solutions that you can layer on to add security or eliminate some vulnerabilities that you perceive to be there. And, and Debbie, would it be usually the case that you start compromising security in order to increase usability due to some either user requests or something like that? I, I think it is a, a kind of a spectrum, you know, where you mm -hmm. look at risk being low risk, high risk, and then you look at access on that spectrum. And 
you know, the more the more open the access is, oftentimes the higher your risk and the less secure it is. Um, the more restrictive the access is, probably more layers of security. So you have to figure out where you need to be in that continuum where you're meeting the organization's goals, what they're willing to accept in the risk spectrum, and I, you have to think about the cost too because, you know, layering lots of security can add a lot of cost. So there's a balance across that continuum and you have to figure out what's the acceptable risk, you know, what can we afford to do to meet that acceptable risk, and what sacrifices are we willing to make in order to achieve those goals and objectives. Um, you know, my staff often recommend, let's put as much security in there as possible, and then it becomes unusable. Um, so we often have to say, well, we have to think about the business requirements. We have to think about where the organization um, needs to be. Um, we can advise and we can explain what the pros and cons are, but at the end of the day, it's a business decision and the organization needs to decide, you know, what they want to do. Can't ultimately be just an IT position. Right. Anthony, if I may comment real quick. Sure. Um, much to um, that comment about the balancing act, I mean, you start getting into the cloud solutions and then you start backing in you know, to all the security that uh, was just mentioned, um, you start to increase your human factor and your cost overhead. Uh, the minute you start to think enterprise DLP or data loss prevention and looking at that and partnering that with moving data around so that you know where your data is and you don't inadvertently send something out, as opposed to channel-based, which, you know, you're scanning your emails for PHI or PI or anything like that, you start to now create a human resource that you now need to fund to watch that stuff. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, I don't know about most IT shops, but the majority of them have security folks that are doing multiple things. They're not sitting there looking at a board, watching these cues, making sure that somebody didn't send something out that got caught to evaluate it, to look at it. So the more you stack on security, um, the more you increase your IT end. You can reduce your, you know, your data center footprint, which, you know, most of us are looking at going to, you know, uh, class four data centers and renting space in there so we don't have to maintain the power, maintain the infrastructure and all that kind of things, which is a savings. But then we flip it around and start to get really tight, tight on security and cause these issues for our own selves and then lo lose our savings. When we can actually position ourselves reasonably secure um, my team is the same um, as well. They're like, wrap this whole thing around this because of mobile technology. We've got to put this in place and that in place. And then, you know, we've tried that. And then they're like, I can't manage this. I can't keep watching this. Mm -hmm. So you have to make something that's sustainable uh, from a cost point of view and a human resources point of view. Well, yeah, ultimately sustainable, but then again, you know, it's a really dicey balancing act. You have to balance the security with the delivery of the product so that your end users feel that they're engaged and they have enough to do their job and everything like that. So it's that constant ebb and flow. Very good. Yeah, and I think Debbie touched on that too. So it's a balancing act. Uh, David, let's go with you on this. This is what you wrote your column about that sort of spurred uh, putting together this webinar. Uh, talk a little bit about the particular challenges around cloud contracting. So when you're negotiating a cloud contract, you're pretty much going to be locked in to the vendor. So it's very important to negotiate a few things up front and really perform some due diligence because this is really a long-term partnership. It's, not, it's almost comparable to an EMR decision because you're not going to rip and replace once you are um, sort of um, contracted with a cloud provider. It's it's just too difficult, it's too costly. So there, there there's a lot of challenges there and you really have to think about cloud negotiations a lot different than software negotiations. Uh, it's really important to think about renewals. You really have to plan five to seven years ahead right now. So you may get a cheap price just because the cloud vendors know that they could get you, they want to get you locked in. You may get a cheap price for a few years, but it's really important to set some precedent as far as how much can they increase their, the pricing 
based upon utilization, whether you're on a subscription model or just a consumption model, to be able to negotiate what does that look like for the next seven years or 10 years, putting some sort of cap on there because I've seen a lot of uh, CIOs who have got into a contractual agreement with a cloud provider and love the product, love the performance, loving the service, but then it got to the point to where when it's time for renewal, it became so expensive and they really did not think about some of those components up front and I would say the second biggest thing is really what happens if the relationship goes sour with the cloud provider? How do you get your data out of there easily in a relatively um, – in a, in a format that is usable? You know, people can give you the data, but it may not be in a format that's usable. But So that, that's really important in negotiating on front uh, with any cloud provider or any SaaS model just – how do you get out of this contract and how do you get your data out in a, in a format that's going to be helpful? Um, obviously, no one wants to think about those type of relationships going sour, but those are some of the things that we need to have to protect the organization and just protect the, the investment that you have made. So I would say those are probably the two big, biggest things I've always uh, encountered when, when, when I'm talking to my counterparts as far as, as, far as their cloud contracting experiences. Sounds like a prenuptial agreement. Scott, let's let's bring you in here, um, and I want to sort of bundle this with, with another question cause that we we're going to touch on. Vendor selection, so um, talk to those uh, health systems listening to the call, uh, to the webinar today, and talk about selecting a cloud provider. Uh, what are some things to look for or some things to avoid? And then you can go ahead and sort of integrate commenting on contracting into your answer. Good, good, yeah. So in terms of um, selection, you know, since we're, we're all here focused on, on healthcare, I think clearly um, understanding of healthcare is, is a critical thing to look for in your cloud service provider. Um, you know, with, there's so many nuances. Uh, you think about remote clinics and VPN connections to the cloud and who's going to maintain those to, of course, the, the one of the Critical topics would be security and privacy and compliance. And you know, it's bigger than security, and it's not just compliance, but it's also uh, uh, privacy. I mean, all of that needs to be deeply understood, I think, by um, by your by your cloud service provider. So those are things to look for. Um, I think we just heard you know some other key elements to look for early on. Is the cloud service provider going to uh, not lock you in? Do they? up front um, have provisions for here's how you can move out. Do they allow you to have native access to a lot of the um, APIs and services of a public cloud provider, for instance? So I'll give an example. AWS has provided about 500 updates within their, their AWS cloud uh, suite over the past year, but many of those updates um, improve security and improve the agility, uh, allow you to, 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 to meet your business and clinical goals uh, better. Um, but how are you going to keep up with those changes? Um, does, does the cloud service provider help you take advantage of those or does it overwhelm you with those? You're going to kind of tease that out and understand are they going to be able to provide some hand-holding to um, both allow you to take advantage of them but, but not um, but not get overwhelmed and be unable to stay secure. Um, I think a, a real key element would be the business associate agreement. Does the cloud provider understand the BAA? Um, I, I speak with many organizations, particularly you know the, the hospitals, who they want the cloud service provider to use their business associate agreement. So their in-house legal counsel or you know, HIPAA attorneys and others to say, you know, look, if you're going to work with us, we need to use our BAA. And uh, most cloud service providers, you know, can't adapt to that, or wouldn't understand the nuances, and and or can't meet the requirements of, uh, of that, and then the broader contracting issues like uh, indemnity uh, and um, cyber uh, liability insurance, um, things like uh, breach response time. Uh, you know, there are federal regulations that allow for a 60-day 
breach notification time period, but most provider organizations expect uh, a far, far faster notification um, of a breach. And is your cloud provider able to understand that and able to respond um, very quickly? So those are things that I think you look for. And some of the ways to help sort of bundle or, or maybe filter or screen that would be to look for certifications. You know, do they have a SOC certification or, or high trust is really the gold standard for um, yeah, for healthcare certification, so that they understand things comprehensively. You know the policy, uh, the people, the process, and, and the technology that, that's necessary for privacy, security, and compliance. So those are some things that I would both look for in the selection, and things that I would start to try to fold into the um, agreements, the contract. And uh, Anthony, I'd mention one thing with. The uh, Scott mentions that we have spent on numerous contracts, and he'll probably agree with me, is, well, it's more the legal team, is they will bat back and forth the state of law in any contract or where they want to argue that arbitrary disagreement. So, you know, most of your vendors are going to want their home state, and your legal team is going to want our home state based on the laws that they, you know, they're familiar with and that they want. I mean, we just finished up one that took us two and a half weeks just to get over that question and come to a reasonable well, agreement. I mean, and they get very passionate about that. that. And it's a very small thing in a contract when you think about it. You know, it's like three or four sentences at the most. But they get very passionate about the state of law that you're going to argue anything that would be in a breach of the contract or anything like that. Right. You know, and actually, this, Scott, one, one of the things I, th I think it's important to add, and uh, I think it was Art who was mentioning really the scope of services and the the element of, you know, how much um, the internal team within IT is going to take on. And I think that is critically important in the early stages of the selection to understand um, what are the roles and responsibilities? Um, what is the scope of service of the cloud service provider? Are they providing you know, raw infrastructure? Are they providing the operating system uh, and security and hardening? Uh, are they going up the stack and providing a platform? It's very, very important to understand that. And then when you get into the contracting, you know, if necessary, having a detailed, like an ITIL style RACI that describes the, who's responsible and, and accountable and consulted and informed. So, so it's very clear up front. Um, if you set it up up front, then it's it's easier, smoother operating, uh, you know, day to day once you're you're working together. Hey, Debbie, this is anything? Debbie. I, yeah, I, I just would add a couple of things. I, I, you know, when we've done our cloud agreements, we've actually created a security addendum that calls out many of the things that Scott has mentioned. But one of the things that we incorporated is the right to audit and the right to access their audit reports. Because you, contractually, when you sign up with a provider, they say, we do all of these things. And you say, yeah, that's great. We you know, see that you're doing all the things one would expect. But you want to assure throughout the term of the agreement that they're continuing to follow those security practices that they stated they did. And so we've incorporated language into our agreements that gives us access to their reports. We know where their issues are. We can see what their action plans are to make corrective measures and have the ability to review to make sure that they're still maintaining those security practices that they spoke about at the beginning of the of the contracting process. And then when you're talking about cloud agreements, now you really have to be clear about the service level that you're expecting from that vendor and um, trying to articulate key metrics that demonstrate success against those service levels I think is critical to the contract and something that we try to really be very clear about in our agreements and um, penalties if they're not meeting those agreements, um, you know, so that there's a stake in the game to make sure that you're getting what you want. And then the last thing I would say is when you go to the cloud, um, business continuity um, is a, a factor because if you don't have redundancy in your path to get to wherever your data is, 
and it goes down, you're down. Um, so you mm -hmm. have to think about the, um, you know, how are you going to maintain access to that solution or wherever it is that you're hosting your data and that you've got redundancy to the internet or VPN connections, whatever it is. Um, and I would hope that it's not with the same uh, you know, service provider and that you've got redundancy there. So we think about those things as well. Very good. All right. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, let us go with, um, there we go. Um, David, what are the main challenges healthcare organizations face when choosing to work directly with large public cloud providers like AWS or Azure, which you mentioned earlier in the event? So my experience is if you're working for an extremely risk-averse organization, just negotiating terms and conditions can be a hurdle, <laughs> and you may not even ever come to an agreement. Um, my last organization, they were, they, we actually had an issue with like Azure and Microsoft where um, we, we had unlimited liability. Well, a company like Microsoft or Amazon will not have any of those provisioning in their terms and conditions. So. Um, I, I think contractually, there's a big hurdle. The second is if you're really working for a risk-averse organization, um, there's always the, the compliance stop of where security comes in, where they, they believe the public cloud providers are not secure enough. Well, I think it's actually the other way around, because I would put up any public cloud provider security um, versus what people can build on-premise. So those are the two biggest hurdles outside of even having discussion about whether the healthcare application can reside in a public cloud provider. I think that's a separate discussion, but just getting through the two hurdles of internal um, organizations who are risk averse with contractually, whether they could come to terms with working with these public cloud providers, and number two, whether uh, from a compliance and internal risk, whether they feel that the public cloud providers are more secure. Those are the main challenges I have faced um, when trying to move towards a public cloud service provider like AWS and Azure. Bart, uh, would uh, Google be included in that? Um, yeah, Google's uh, pretty much, you know, set in their agreements. Um, they weren't they didn't want to sign RBAA, which has already been mentioned. Um, they're HIPAA disclosures. They want you to subscribe to those. And they're very, very clear, and they're very cloudy at the same time. And what I mean by that is you will get Google Apps completely secure from a HIPAA perspective and everything like that. And like I mentioned earlier, in the agreements, they want their BEAA, which is ultimately what we went to. Um, and from that perspective, you really need to read that one 15-page document because there's a core set of applications, and most of your, you know, providers do this, that they will certify if you set them up correctly, which we did, that it's HIPAA compliant. But then you get the user community that's like, oh, Google Hangouts, we can do telemedicine. Oh, no, you can't because it's not one of the core applications. And people think that when you get that core suite of applications, it's completely HIPAA compliant. Well, you know, that presents, again, challenges. That presents an educational challenge uh, and a monitoring challenge, and that's, you know, where we, where we currently run into things. So, you know, from that perspective, you do run into these issues, and they get very – the larger providers are like, you're going to use this, and they have the ability to say, you either use it, or we're not selling it. Pretty plain and simple. I, mean, I think what I what I found is that companies that are um, providing technology where you're a tenant, if you will, in their environment, mm -hmm. and that you're you're basically sharing that platform with their entire customer base. And when they upgrade, they upgrade the entire customer base, or when they make changes, it's for the entire customer base versus I'm going to host your environment in my data center. It's separate from all my other customers. When you're in that tenant environment, the flexibility that you have in contracting is limited because 
they have to respond to their entire customer base and react the same way to their entire customer base. So the ability to modify and adopt language specific to your company gets limited. When you're in more of that, I'm going to host your environment, I think you have more latitude to drive contractual language. At least that's been my experience. And I think with Microsoft, you know, as we just did our, our renewal and our moving to the cloud with our Microsoft suite, um, we ran into that with them. This is our contract. This is the same for all of our cust our healthcare customers, and we're not going to change it. And so you really kind of have to say, is this good enough for us? And uh, you know that's that's hard to do. You want to negotiate specific things that your organization feels are critical, and you can't. They just won't do yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, you Scott, need to go into that. Oh, go ahead, you need to go, go into ahead. yeah. You need to go into that. Um, much like she, you know, it was just mentioned. I mean, can you just think of Google? Can you imagine them having these little clauses all over the place, and then having to check that when they do an upgrade on a Thursday afternoon to make sure they haven't violated a contract somewhere? They just will never do it, just like Microsoft does. I mean, you can see their point of view. If I was in that point of view, there's no way that I would actually want to negotiate a contract with all these little things in it because there's no way for me to keep track of it. And I'm going to violate something somewhere. Scott, if you want to jump in here, um, it, it seems like in every in every customer vendor relationship, someone's the bigger fish and someone's the smaller fish. Um, and the bigger fish is going to be less inclined to negotiate. And that can flip depending on the size of the healthcare system and the size of the cloud provider, it changes the dynamics as everyone was just touching on. So uh, just give me your thoughts around that. Yeah, so this, this whole challenge of working with the public cloud. You know, overall, I think there is a very strong uh, net benefit to working for the, the working with AWS or Azure or Google, for example. Uh, but I think some of it does involve triaging your risk. You know, it doesn't mean some applications have so many millions of records or so much data uh, that, you know, you wouldn't want them in, an, in a semi-secure environment. Um, others, again, like, you know, office automation documents, those have company secure, uh, so there's, there's risk that way, but there's, there's typically and hopefully not as much PHI. So I think there is some, some, some thinking through of developing your roadmap of which applications should go, should remain on-prem and which should go to a cloud and which cloud should they go to. So I think there's you know, just some thinking and, and, and there's folks that have experience in, in doing that, helping you think through that. Um, the other key thing is there's this, again, this issue of shared responsibility. So the, the public uh, cloud providers are, are saying in general that the consumer of the cloud, the user of the cloud, the hospital system in this case, has bottom line most of the responsibility. The cloud provider is going to say our data center is secure, you know, we, you don't even know where it is, and the hardware is secure, but above that, it's really the user's responsibility. And the BAA, even though, even though um, Debbie and others have described that they're often not negotiated, it's take it or leave the BAA, even that BAA is limited in coverage, and if you misconfigure the environment, you may invalidate the BAA and not know it. So there's really not any guardrails as you continue to operate in, in the public cloud. So um, there are ways to help guard against that, and that's, I mean, one of the, the you know, clear data's key services is we help design and then monitor, and, you know, Debbie talked about um, access to auditing artifacts and things like that. I think you should look for somebody who would even proactively provide those to you without even, you even asking, you know, here's the state of our security, and here's how we know that we're still in compliance with the BAA. And here's how you can even get, uh, you know, a much more robust BAA, uh, particularly for workloads and applications that are that are really really sensitive. So I think there's ways to to navigate through, you know, what can be kind of a minefield uh, when you're trying to take advantage of of the power of these uh, these public clouds. Very good. All right. I want to get in an audience question that's come in. Uh, we are running short on time, but let's get this in. Debbie, let's, let's run this by you first, and then our, you can respond. Is everyone's cloud, cloud strategy that of cloud first? 
discrete uh, SaaS apps one at a time? Or is anyone evaluating complete data center outsourcing to a single cloud vendor? Um, we, are, we do not focus on cloud first. Um, I think we're evaluating um, new technologies uh, as they're being brought forward um, and determining what's the best fit. Um, we're not doing a full outsource thought or, uh, you know, take our data center. Um, there's such a huge investment that we've already made in our data centers, and um, it just doesn't make financial sense to abandon that to go to the cloud at this point for us. I think if we were in a situation where we required a major renovation or uh, update to our data center, we'd certainly be evaluating cloud as an option for us. So I think it's just as the new capabilities or um, refresh of our infrastructure is coming about that we're making those evaluations. Um, I do think that uh, it, it it is probably more and more of our technology is going that direction. Um, and I think you have to be prepared for it and have to understand it and be able to, you know, explain the pros and cons of it to your organization. Art? Yeah, um, we, we actually looked at outsourcing the cloud, uh, our data center to the cloud when we were looking at moving our data center. So it ended up not being an option just because of our you know, our technology solutions that we were bought into uh, in general, uh, which is blade frame technology and virtual machines. We'd already had significant enough uh, hardware invested in that, which gave us the leverage that we wanted. Um, and then the on-site data center and the DR site that we have, um, when we went and contracted with another um, professional data center that sits away from us a considerable distance, the footprint and cost was uh, cost effective for us to move what we had for hardware there, retire the space and the maintenance that we had to upkeep the one that we had, which allowed us to create two um, managed by us um, DR sites. So we have two DR sites and we have a data center and that space savings cost us that. We didn't go to the cloud. Um, on the same token, I have a lot of applications now moving to a SaaS uh, solution across the board. Like I mentioned, a lot of my regulatory apps for pharmacy and stuff like that for the state sit in a SaaS solution um, with the exception of our EHRs, which are ultimately sitting on those blade frames in the data center. And then, you know, having two DR sites, which is nice. Um, so I don't think fully cloud outsourcing, we did look at that, and it just wasn't an option for us, but we did significantly reduce our costs by, um, like Deborah said, wisely choosing the technology that you're going to invest in and then justifying it with the organization, which is what we had to do. Very good. Scott, before we run, is there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I do think it is, it's an exciting time. And it is absolutely worth starting. Uh, you know, a lot of things we brought up are, are big and complicated topics. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, a good place to start would be looking at something small, a pilot application, and, and that can help address from the very top of the conversation issues related to staff. You know, are the infrastructure people nervous? Can you get the, the, the legal team on board? Um, and all the way to uh, through some of the contractual issues. So I think I think there are enough advantages to where it's it's worth getting started, and, and sometimes it's it's good to start small to, to get the experience. So uh, a great great uh, session, and really appreciated uh, appreciated the different perspectives that we've had today. I would have to agree with you. It was an excellent session. We covered a lot of great topics. I want to thank everyone uh, for attending. Uh, please take a moment and answer our post event survey. I want to thank our panel, David Chow, Art Ream, Debbie Gish, and Scott White, and our sponsor, Clear Data, for making the event possible. Uh, you'll receive an email when our archive recording has been posted to our YouTube channel within two business days, if not sooner. Uh, attending our events gets you a Chime CHCIO credit. So let Chime know you were here, and if you ask us to do so, we will. 
To produce a webinar panel discussion on the topic of your choice, please contact Nancy Wilcox for more information. And if you need a certificate of attendance for another CEU program, use the final slide in this deck. And of course, you can go to our website to see our upcoming schedule. So again, I want to thank our panel, our audience, Clear Data, and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.